This is a production of Cornell University. As always, we wanted to uh, recognize everybody who, who's helped put these webinar series together. Uh, GCSAA uh, New York, the new chapter here. Suzanne Miss, uh, the chapter administrators, helped us out putting together all the uh, guests we've had over the course of the last three weeks. Um, so today is our, our the last in uh, the three-part installment here. We're going to have Ian Andrew. Sorry, Ian, I put an extra S on there. Uh, Ian Andrew, uh, the Andrew Golf Design, and, and also a writer, uh, talking to us today about uh, what we can get away with um, in terms of golf course design. Uh, and again, quick shout out to the partners and the sponsors, uh, again, making this webinar available. So platinum sponsors, Andre and Son, First Turf and Ornamental, uh, Grassland and Harrells, Gold sponsors, Finch Turf, BASF, Pump Irrigation Technologies, and MTE. Uh, and then our silver sponsors as well, Syngenta, Ewing, Nutrient Solutions, Turf and Soil Diagnostic, uh, Weaver Golf and Turf, and DryJet. Um, so what we'll start with today is, is the usual format. Uh, we'll get started with Dr. Frank Rossi. Frank, give us a little uh, rundown on, on what we've got the last week growing season-wise, uh, and then we'll get into uh, introducing our guest. Sure thing, Carl. And again, uh, thanks to everybody for joining us. And, uh, and uh, uh, we'll remind you again about surveys uh, we want you to fill out. Um, uh, we have those available in the chat. Carl's going to give you a link to the survey. We're trying to determine, you know, how much this is worth doing, how much you like it, what parts you like, don't like. And we've been so thrilled to, chat, to partner with the GCSA and why. Just a very exciting time to get the whole thing kicked off. So uh, golf course superintendent, uh, you know, I spend probably more time looking at Twitter than I should these days. Uh, I just love this picture that a superintendent took uh, on the beach at about 3.30 in the morning when ba basically the only people awake are golf course superintendents, I think, uh, trying to get to the golf course to work. And out through the sky, you could see the various planets. And, you know, though everything's continuing to move around, no matter how hectic uh, sometimes things uh, tend, uh, tend to be and feel like they can be. Uh, Brian Diagno uh, put out a nice little tweet that I just loved, uh, you know, Everybody who didn't listen to us about not fertilizing is now going to see uh, what the, what what uh, what they have what wrath they will incur from any application of fertilizer that was made maybe uh, prematurely. Now you may be happy uh, with all the car traffic, but uh, you know should I go out? Should I not? And and this is an example. And since we got into lawnmowers, everybody started tweeting these great uh, old-fashioned lawnmowers. This is the Indian Motorcycle Company. Look at the hood ornament on a lawnmower. You, you gotta love, uh, you gotta love grass guys. All right, so golf is open uh, just about everywhere. It looks like except Maryland, Vermont, New Hampshire, uh, and Massachusetts. California's got some restrictions. Some people are open, some people aren't. Uh, this is a, again, a full dynamic process. But I think, listen, as, as we as an industry become comfortable uh, with a process and set procedures in place, uh, I think, Everybody's saying golf can benefit uh, in some strange way from this whole thing because of the nature of the way it happens. Now, we, we may be sorry about this, but, you know, carts are coming out, right? Are you going to increase your cart fleet? Are they allowed? Can they be clean? This was a little discussion I had with some of the leadership of the New York State Golf Foundation, uh, Ken Benoit uh, and Blake, Halder, uh, Blake uh, Halderman Ash off was on the conversation and talking about how you're going to clean them. Are you going to let members rent them? This is another aspect of a golf operation that obviously, you know, if you normally have 40 and you're only going to do one, or you're going to put that plexiglass thing, or maybe the caddy's going to drive it and people are going to walk and just come and get their clubs. I think arts are going to be, as we've realized a big part of what the revenue stream is in golf. And I don't see us giving it up uh, easily even if golfers uh, start to enjoy walking again. This is a big revenue source for us. All right, as we get out there and work, uh, we're so uh, thrilled to have our colleagues at Rutgers University and, and the diagnostic clinic that Rich Buckley runs uh, out of that second bedroom, at least currently, and has a colleague, Meredith <laughs> Melendez, that wrote a nice little piece about, hey, if you're going to make sanitation stuff, be careful about it. If you're going to use bleach, don't start spraying bleach all over yourself. Here's how you dilute it. 
uh, let's be smart about these things. And there's lots of resources for how to do it smartly. All right, let's talk about the, my favorite part, the growing season. Um, this is what it was like uh, in the beginning of April. And you can see it was starting to warm. And last week we said we were cooled off and a few warm days begins to drive soil temperatures, right? So look at how the soil temperatures have risen well into the 60s and may even be more specifically if you're managing this, uh, looking at this at your own place. And just a reminder, right? These are a couple of our soil temperature triggers, well-established uh, disease management uh, protocol. That, that if you feel you've had a consistent problem with these things, of course, we've got this wonderful resource that was uh, initiated by Paul Vincelli and now passed on to uh, Munshaw, Clark, Koch, and a, a whole collection of young pathologists that give us really good information. This should be on your desktop. What about degree days? Again, last week, you could see most of us were about two weeks or 21 days behind throughout much of upstate New York. You could see even in the metropolitan New York area, you were anywhere from a week to two weeks behind normal. And this is what it looks like for the, this, this past coming week. Uh, you can see that we're starting to gain momentum. As of uh, Monday, we were getting closer to normal. However, it still looks like growing degree day accumulation, base 50 growing degree day accumulation will be in the single digits uh, for much of the Northeast region. So again, uh, it's a very slow creep to the growing season. Uh, on the Greencast Syngenta website that you've got to sign up and go through the process of getting, Albert Kopenhofer, I thought, made a pretty bold statement recently saying, listen, <laughs> If you make multiple adult applications this year, that was your best chance of reducing numbers. However, that also leads you down the path of insecticide resistance. So I'll just remind you all, maybe this is a good year for relying on larvicides and some really good information on the way to target those larvicides and scout for them. And I've been fortunate to be associated with the Bethpage State Park guys, Andy Wilson, Mike Hadley, Vinny, and everyone else out there that does the scouting and keeps track of when to target the application, getting it down to a single or one or two applications a year complete. All right, uh, Tommy Witt uh, posted a picture about his high rate uh, PGR application on his Bentgrass fairways in Chicago. You can see the kind of look he's getting. Uh, Paul Koch mentioned the other day about the reddening you might see sometimes as a result of a PGR application when you get some frost. For those of us up, for those of us upstate who have made some PGR applications already, you might see some stunting and some damage as the temperatures are getting cooler. Now, as we enter into the conversation, I'm going to pass it to my colleague Carl Scamenti to introduce our guest for today. Uh, I don't really need to take any questions, Carl. I'll pass it on to you. Here's a really nice tweet from Steve Spadafore, right? How does it take more or less time to mow these fairways in these different directions? And boy, did this tweet get a lot of interest, but nowhere near the interest <laughs> that good old Cornell alum, Tom Kaplan, uh, lineman for the Cornell football team, golf course superintendent down on Long Island, uh, made a comment, uh, hyperbolic, he admitted, uh, about the great conditions when you don't have to take care of the bunker so much, Carl. So I'm going to shut up now and really looking forward to the conversation uh, that will ensue with regard to this. So let me pass it to you, Carl, and introduce our guest for today. Yeah, so uh, I think that's a great transition, Frank. We're talking about uh, our topic today is uh, uh, how little can you get away with? And, and of course, our guest is Ian Andrew, a golf course architect. Frank, you've got a, a photo in the background there of one of his projects, Laval. Um, I think that was done in, in conjunction with Mike Weir. Isn't, isn't that right, uh, Ian? That's correct. And oh, so it's so built for a lefty. It's a left-handed golf course. I'm left-handed. I know. Half the go. players in Canada are left-handed. That's right. And, and you know, a lot of uh, our Canadian audience may recognize Ian's name. He's done quite a bit, bit of work up there. Uh, St. George's, uh, uh, notably. Um, and, and also has just released a book actually on Stanley Thompson, the Canadian architect who, who built St. George's. Um, so if, you, if you're interested in that, if you're at a Stanley Thompson course, I'd, I'd really recommend maybe doing that. So uh, I know you won't promote yourself, Ian, but I'm going to do it for you, andrewgolf.com. Um, that's where you can, can kind of look at all Andrew's work, uh, Ian's work, excuse me. So with that, Ian, um, I'll let you go ahead and share your screen. And uh, uh, really excited to hear today about uh, 
you know, kind of the minimalist aspects of golf architecture that uh, can still provide a fun playing experience and interesting playing experience. Um, so uh, take it away. Thank you. So one of the things that was interesting for me was uh, uh, when we entered into this, it gave me an opportunity to pivot. And uh, the question ended up being, how much could we, uh, what could we get away with if we, if we actually had to change the game a little bit? I thought it was an interesting topic. So my cover slide happens to be for people who have seen it, Monroe Country Club in 1951. And what's most interesting for me is at the time they still had fescue rough. But it also shows a little bit of um, our expectations were, were lower. And um, you know, this does bring the whole question of, uh, can we get away with a little less? So one of the things I wanted to point out is, if we got back to the basics of the game, this is essentially what it looks like. In this case, there are no tees. It's just fairways and greens. It's a, a little public facility that I took my kids out to play to try. It reminds us that the game's actually a little simpler than we always expect it to be. But I think what's most important is I talk about, you know, what can we do to, uh, if we had to bring the game backwards a little bit and uh, make the game simpler, what could we do? So the obvious thing is bunkers. And, um, you know, the first argument against it is bunkers create strategy. And one of the things I wanted to point out was we actually need a lot less than people think. So I thought this would be kind of fun just to pick a particular golf hole and look at it. So um, this is the 18th of Beth Page, which a lot of people are familiar with. And the 18th of Beth Page to me is um, one of the most overdone holes that I know of. So I thought it'd be a fun one to pick on. Uh, a concept that I like to mention is so dumb that Lucas Glover hit a six iron off the tee in the US Open just to avoid all the, the trouble because there was no percentages in it. So, this is just to point out that the exact same strategy can be accomplished with 60% less sand. And that's part of the reduction sometimes can be in surface area. But the other end of it is, if you start to look at what's essential, uh, if you look at these three bunkers, they actually accomplish the same question as the original architecture. And now we're down to 80% less sand. And because there's far less bunkers, it actually invites more aggressive play because it's less obvious. And again, if we start to look at the idea of risk and reward, creating a carry angle on the left-hand side, opening things up on the right, which by the way would open things up for playability, you're now asked whether you want to take on the trouble to open up a, a much uh, uh, an easier approach or play wide and then have to hit a better shot in. And this is more of risk and reward strategy as opposed to a penal point of view. And if you notice, we're now down to four bunkers and 85% of the sand. Well, if we combine those bunkers, we're now down to two. We're still asking a strategic question that whole still holds up really well. Uh, there's a lot more risk reward intent. It's a lot more playable because now you've got fairway running up to the green and you can play to a safer side. And because if you mowed down the bank on the right-hand side and you cut it tight, that would be more effective than a bunker on that right-hand side. This is essentially all you need for this particular hole. So what I wanted to make really crystal clear for everybody is we always assume bunkers define strategy for a golf course and are an essential element. They are important because they have a visual impact, but you don't need quite as much as you, you think you do. And that's one of the things is the biggest win is always in the bunkering. So a good example just to kind of drive that home is uh, Augusta National started with 29 bunkers. It has 44 and a vast majority of those are doubled up and tripled up bunkers. They're just fairway bunkers that the Fazio group's been adding recently. It still didn't have a lot of bunkers up until about 20 years ago, but you don't need much to create strategy. What uh, you've got some alternatives that can create strategy, whether it's just mowing a lot of short areas or, fair, or green contours, but bunkers are less essential than most people think. Um, one of the things that's interesting is if you watch, if you, I, I had the opportunity to go around when we were looking at Laval, I went around with Mike Weir and I've been around Augusta and that's actually Mike. It was just the two of us there. What plays a major role in where they play their 
uh, positional shots to is the, the slopes of the greens. The, the bunkers are not as important to them because they're not really worried about getting up and down from them, but they're always looking at um, green slopes and then how to attack the hole using those green slopes. So the greens actually are the primary source of strategy for a golf hole. So Riviera the 10th is probably the best example I can possibly provide for you. And if you, uh, anybody who's ever been there, you're drawn to try and take a direct line at the green. And the funny part about it is, essentially that's the worst direction you can choose to go. If you end up on line with the green, because the green runs away from play, you really can't hit the green with a pitch shot. It's too difficult to shot. And even the pros have a lot of trouble making that shot. But the further left, the further you get away from the bunkering, the more ideal the approach is. And funny enough, the, the left rough, as far over as you could possibly go with a full swing is actually the way that the pros who choose to lay out play for this hole. So essentially the green strategy or the green surface itself is really the defining strategy of this golf hole. And it's the one that means uh, it, it determines where you want to be and how you want to approach things. And actually the bunkers are just there to fool you. So as I said, bunkers are less important than you think. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to take the bunkers that you have. If you're looking to make things a little bit more efficient is try to make them matter more. So uh, the definition of a great bunker is one that you have to flirt with to score better. So this is uh, the six at Royal Melbourne. And if you play tight to the fairway bunkers on the right-hand side, which is the longest carry, if you can make the carry, you, you actually get a pretty good look at the green and the green beads towards you. So you're well rewarded for taking that risk. Because of the way the slopes work in the hole, you can play around the bunkers or you can take the short carry, but now you've got to face the most, um, the most diabolical bunker of all is the front left, which is about 10 to 12 feet deep and everything runs down to that bottom. And it's a very intimidating bunker shot from down in there. So what you try to do is you try to simplify it that you need to flirt with something in order to score. And that's sort of how you pair back your bunkers. Every, every other um, bunker is less relevant than those bunkers. So if you're trying to get yourself down to basic strategies, you're trying to get yourself down to that. So how do you sell this to uh, a membership? The, Front, the right side image is um, the beginning point with four bunkers. The only bunker that really mattered was the inside left. The bottom is a, a Photoshop illustration. Everybody's pretty good at Photoshop nowadays, but it, it's showing the, um, what it can look like afterwards. And if you look at that image or you look at the final results of it, this is Maple Downs, you can see that the false front, the, the runoff areas essentially provide the same thing. What they do is they repel golf shots. So what we're looking at is the maintenance is reduced to a single bunker instead of four bunkers. And now you're asking short grass to do a lot of the other, um, uh, let's call it defense to the hole. And, and this is a way of simplifying things. The reason I bring up this slide is I did, this pro I did the planning for this project in 208, 209. And that was when we went through the financial crisis. The financial crisis for us in Southern Ontario was devastating. And what it did is it brought up the uh, question of economic sustainability in golf. And I think that's about where we're going to go again um, um, post-crisis now. And that's why I bring this up. And that's why I thought steering this presentation towards that sort of um, uh, talks about where we might or probably will end up going. Um, this is uh, a, just an overall uh, uh, plan for the golf course. And essentially, we pared everything from 56 down to 39 bunkers. And we also pared down the maintenance, the, the style of maintenance. And that was part of what we did. We, we were actually in a green rebuilding program. But that was part of what we did at the same time, is we just got everything down to what we thought was essential. Um, this is a picture of one of the holes. You can see by the red lines that essentially the two bunkers are there. I'd argue you could remove the first one, but you can see the shape of an S-shaped fairway. That is a great way of creating risk and reward. But there could be bunkers on the right-hand side. This hole used to have six bunkers. Uh, there could be fairway bunkers on the right-hand side, but they're not really necessary. Being out of position is uh, just as much um, a hindrance to a player scoring. So essentially what you're saying is where you wanna be is where all the trouble is.
And if you don't take on the trouble, then you've got to take on trouble on the next shot. And that's, that's sort of the, 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 this is the basic risk and reward scenario. And if you think about this idea, this probably does answer what's necessary and what's not necessary at your golf course. So here's a good example. This happens to be Cragburn. Um, the outside bunkers on this hole are not necessary. If you hit the ball through, you're in the rough, penalty number one. You're out of position, penalty number two. And you don't have a great look at that green site because you're now at an off angle, penalty number three. That's as, that works just as well as actually having bunkers out there. And in fact, you could argue that the bunkers actually contain the shots from getting further away and put the players in a better position and an elite player will actually be able to hit a decent shot out of that with some spin because they can spin the ball out of the bunkers, particularly when the bunker lie is flat. So being out of position is enough. You don't have to contain everything. You don't have to penalize everything. By the way, the um, target bunkers were not part of the golden age, not part of the uh, teens, 20s, and 30s. They were something that was added to the game in modern times, uh, mainly to provide definition. They actually don't really have that much strategic relevance to the game whatsoever. So this is probably my greatest pet peeve is uh, bunkers that are done strategic, wow, strategic or done specifically for um, aesthetics. Uh, I think this is the sort of thing that should be the first removal is uh, getting rid of, um, if this was a waste area, I wouldn't have as big a problem with it, but the fact that it's got high faces and, and details to it, and, and in this case, you can see it's all being edged, it's a complete waste of time to me. So this is what I think the game will, will throw away very quickly uh, if push comes to shove. So what I wanted to make really clear to, um, to all of you is, the area in the foreground, the short grass, particularly with a sharp slope, is every bit as much a penalty to an elite player as that bunker is in behind. Uh, that happens to be Mike Clayton. Mike Clayton uh, was a former uh, tour player uh, from Australia. But we talked about the fact that the balls all run to the flats and, and he can spin it. And so he, has, um, he feels as confident there as he does in the hollows. And he said with the hollows, one of the things he struggles with is sometimes he'll get a really tight lie and he's not sure where to use the green. And he said he'd actually rather be in the bunkers for the most part because it's, they put him in a much better position. And that gives you sort of an idea that short grass is an alternative, particularly the way we maintain it in current times, as tight as we maintain it. So one of the things that I like architecturally with short grass, um, this is Laval sur Lac, is that once a player misses, particularly a good player, there's no ring of rough at the back to contain them. So once they miss either side to the side or long, which is more common with the elite player and a higher handicap has a tendency to miss short. Once the ball has missed, rather than just sitting in the ring where they play a little bump and run back, make an easy par, now all of a sudden the ball runs and goes. So the beauty is that now they have a much more difficult recovery shot. And this is why when we put these areas in, the, a lot of times you get resistance because they say you're going to make the game easier, but it actually starts to make it harder for the elite player. Uh, one of the examples I love to use is in the front two bunkers, particularly on the right, you're in great shape to get up and down at Shinnecock's 11th hole. The side bunkers are much worse because you've got to deal with that severe green slope. But the short grass over the back, which looks like an easy recovery, is actually the mo is probably the most impossible shot I've ever seen because there is no way to stop the ball. And essentially, it's going to run off the front, usually back into the bunkers. And it's a good example where often short grass is actually a tougher um, element to deal with. But it's one that I find committees don't understand that the fact that it's much hard. And that's maybe one of the beauties for us as architects. It's much harder than it looks whereas bunkers look hard and sometimes are easier than they initially appear. So the beauty of chipping areas for golf is they provide uh, option of flop shot, chip, or a putt. The elite player has a tendency to always want to use their wedge because that gives them full control, but the tighter the lie, the harder the shot it is for them. And we all know for the high handicaps, they love these options uh, because they play to their favorite shot. Most of them putt. Um, a lot of... Uh, um, my father's uh, in his 90s. He plays bump and run shots still, um, and it allows him to show his creativity. But the beauty is the short grass areas 
they maintain the difficulty for the elite player, but they are the only thing that uh, levels the playing field for the higher handicap. And the beauty of it is, for all of us talking today, it's far easier to maintain than a bunker. So if you think about it, if you have, say, 50 or 60 bunkers, and you end up with 20 chipping areas instead and 40 bunkers for argument's sake, you're not dealing with washouts, you're not dealing with a lot of problems. Yes, there's some increased maintenance to do with the fact that you're gonna have to spray and cut these areas, but it, it takes away the, um, the damage control that you have to do. And I do find that um, the playability and um, uh, the fact that you don't have to go and main, uh, rebuild these or, or, or do major works to them on a regular basis, like you do with the bunkers, because bunkers do have a shelf life. This is a far easier element to deal with. And I, I think this is where golf's gonna go. I think the um, chipping areas are gonna increase in use and I think the bunkers are gonna decrease over time. So Pinehurst to me is the greatest example of um, explaining to a, a good player or a great player why this works. Um, tough as nails in the US Open uh, and yet it's a golf course you can't lose a ball. And I do find high handicaps can play to their handicap here. And I've yet to play with a really, really uh, top-notch player who can play to their handicap in this golf course, particularly when it's a little bit firm and dry. Um, so it shows you that the chipping areas have um, a, sort of a, a, a double effect. It, 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 it can hurt. I mean, I've, I've, been in, I've made my triple bogeys out here too. But the other thing is the recovery shots. I get to play the, the shots most comfortable. And a lot of times I can get up and down because I'm actually pretty good with the bump and run. Bunkers are an element that are sort of absolute. A great player with a good bunker game, it's not a big deal, particularly how you guys maintain them nowadays. Um, for a high handicap who's not got any bunker game, they can be devastating to a round. So I wanted to show you some alternatives that uh, I think could come into play. So this is Royal Adelaide. You can see the ridge between the fairway and the green. So this is a view from the other side. I happen to think this is one of the best holes in all of golf. What I love about this hole is it's definitely reachable with a driver and there's nothing worse than hitting your ball just left because it's still cut as fairway. And trying to find this, this green is almost impossible with a, a pitch less than the full club because the green actually runs towards the back. But this sort of idea, there's not a single bunker on it, should be something we should see regularly in golf. But we see very few examples of this and I think this is sort of one of these details that could really make a comeback. Here's a, an example of Pete Dye doing something similar. This is simply two feet, or two feet, sorry. Yeah, it's two feet on the left edge and it's three and a half to four feet by those stairs. There's fairway just on the other side of that bank and there's fairway running to that bank. That's just simply a, a 45 degree angle of bluegrass. It's the golf club in, in New Albany, Ohio. But this has an incredible impact on this hole, and yet it's such a simple feature, and it's not a long bank to have to maintain. Um, I do see going forward that some of these ideas will finally start to make a comeback. Some of these simpler, uh, easier to maintain ideas are actually pretty strong. It's just we, we seem to get sort of caught up in the idea of bunkering always, rather than looking for something that's a little more uh, creative and clever like this. Great example of Glens Falls. Uh, nowadays, I see these, uh, this bank will be covered in bunkers. This hole does not need bunkers. It, it does have one on the outside right, but the bank, once you miss that green, it's, it's bounding down. And the other end of it is, the result of a, a grass bank is a little bit more arbitrary, which that is something we do need to return to golf. I'd also argue, I wish bunkers were less well-maintained as an architect, because I think the result should be a little bit more arbitrary and then they'd have more strategic value. So this is a great example of, um, if this had bunkers, this hole wouldn't be that difficult. The fact that the green actually falls away, this is the third at Augusta, the green falls away and yet the front bank is cut short, makes this the hardest hole in the golf course, according to Mike when we were talking about it. It's so hard to hit that delicate shot in but because the ball will back up and go 25 to 30 feet away from that bank, and that shot being a half wedge pitch shot, which is probably the least comfortable shot for even an elite player, 
these are the sort of features that easier to just simply mow that as fairway, not deal with a bunker, not deal with 45 degree bluegrass banks. This is more impactful than actually a bunker or a, or a bunker and bank would be. So I'd like to see these features come back. And I think if we look at some of these, we don't necessarily need those super deep, steep fronting bunkers where sometimes we could turn these into um, sharp fairways where the ball's running back and it would actually have a, a bigger impact if you're trying to play defense. Um, one thing to keep in mind is on a playability end, if you do this, you, you have to make sure that the higher handicaps have somewhere to bail. And that's, as an architect, important to sometimes uh, not sort of ramp things up to a point where you li people literally will end up picking up and going on to the next hole. So bunkers themselves by number, you could probably, I find most courses I've been to, uh, I could probably take out a third of the bunkers comfortably. And the next part is bunker maintenance itself. I think that's where we're going to need to go. Um, this is Penfield. One of the things with Penfield was um, we did a major bunker reduction, uh, got them to be efficient, but we also created a bank to try and reduce the maintenance. I'm going to make the point of, as an architect, I believe you, if you have nothing to maintain that's difficult, then your golf course is usually pretty dull. Um, what I try to do is just limit it to something like this, where the, the bank matters and then try to ease off the rest of the maintenance. That's kind of my viewpoint. I, I, I do believe you should have little things to deal with because that's what cr um, creates the architectural interest. So uh, this is St. George's. These are pretty high faces. Um, the way it's dealt with is detailing. And I think you can have high faces. You just have to detail them out. The best way I can put it is your expenses up front. If you spend the money up front, which yes, it's very expensive, and that's why you try to take a bunker reduction if you're gonna go with high faces and you try to limit how much of the face you're gonna show up. This is historically important, so we kept all the original faces, but you must detail it to avoid washouts and erosion. Uh, we'd had a five inch uh, rain event that took place in the middle of this bunker project. Um, this is a picture from that event. Um, that's actually the on-ramp. Uh, the bunkers did not wash out at all. So if you detail it, you can actually take away that maintenance. But again, there's a massive expense up front if that's the route you're gonna go. Otherwise, I would say for the most part, if we were, if I was looking sort of forward thinking and, and things have changed, uh, bringing the grass to the floor is one of the most important things. Uh, what it does is obviously starts to remove washouts. By the way, the way we detailed this, is if you put an interceptor around the base of the grass bank, that also deals with the sort of that initial flush you can get at the edge because of what it does is it just draws the water instantly in. And so we didn't see any washouts by adding that detail. Um, but the other end of this is this saves uh, sand volume too. If you've got no high sand faces, um, you're limiting the bunker to the area that it needs to be to defend or define whatever you're trying to do with it. Again, this is Park Club in Buffalo. Um, this is historically accurate, so that's why the bunker winds its way around uh, the eighth green. This is grass face, but this does nothing to ease maintenance. You might as well have high faces. Um, I would jokingly say, if this is what your architect suggests, then you get a new architect. Um, old school methods are a way of dealing with things. Um, uh, I started working with a place called Lookout Point and discovered that it's built on gravel and they did clay lining and that was where I learned um, that back in the 20s they did a lot of clay lining, sort of understood that that was what that layer was that I kept finding at some of the bunker work. So here's a good example where we're clay lining bunkers and by the way it can be organic clay, uh, over experimenting with time with just having trouble finding clay in Montreal because Montreal is all uh, shale underneath. You have to line your bunkers. But this is a way of, of dealing with things. It, it's a lot cheaper. At the time we were doing this for about $500 a bunker. And it gives you a um, lookout point. We're done in 22 and they still had no rock problems. What we do a lot of around Buffalo area, um, part of it's budget related, part of it is just lack of um, native materials is grass lining. Grass lining lasts a shorter time but if you've got a tight budget, it's certainly an answer and it does buy you um, extra time 
because it takes a while for that um, organic layer to break down finally before the, the stone starts to push through. So this is an alternative. There are cheaper alternatives to things and if you're on a tight budget. What I wanna point out is essentially erosion is the enemy. Uh, doing nothing means you're one bad washout from rebuilding again. Um, once this happens, your bunkers are actually done. It's just a matter of when. And I've seen this happen um, at a uh, project in Nova Scotia, not one I had anything to do with, where I went out to see an off, a new golf course and they have one of the bunkers where all the water ran across the green and through and all the shale underneath was exposed. And it, that bunker was done that, and it was not even a year old. And the worst part was that meant they had to strip out the whole thing to replace the sand. But every time that happens, they're gonna run into the same thing. And every bunker needs a, a detail at the edge. So one of the best pieces of advice I can give you is uh, your, if you've got a soil edge, uh, essentially that's erosion. Um, it's organized erosion, but it's erosion. And your bunker lifespan is essentially 10 years max if you're, uh, edging, if you're edging bunkers, because essentially they break down and they, they wash out too easily and you get contamination and you get contamination in your drains. So the most important thing is to come up with a detail. You should never be edging bunkers um, uh, with soil edges. There's a, this happens to be Castle Stewart during the build-in. That's actually Gilhans on the, uh, the left-hand side. They do um, a lot of bunkers he builds. He does the revetted edges, which you can see on the very left-hand side of the boys. And on the right-hand side, that is what's called chunking, which is a native grasses uh, packed in, and that also is an edge. And that's essentially what you're trying to, to deal with chunking. But this is a National Golf Club in Toronto. Just growing over the edges, um, what he uh, does is undercutting there, which you remove soil and then curl the, the grass in and, and pin it in place. Uh, soils allow for that there. Doing that uh, gives you an edge, but you need to come up with, a, with an edge that's not soil and that will double the length of your lifespan if you never have any exposed soil and if you have a liner underneath. And I think in today's day and age where we can't afford to do much, and I think going forward, economically, we're gonna struggle, you need an edge. Uh, another, um, if, if the environment allows for it, fescue uh, faces. This is Plymouth Country Club I work with in Massachusetts. What they do is they, cut these sometimes, they don't cut them other times, but all the banks are fescue faces and that's how they limit the amount of maintenance because they've got a small crew and a small budget. And anytime you can do this, they do unfortunately, um, particularly in uh, south facing slopes, dry out, you may have to do work. Uh, one of the ways to deal with that is if you actually have a fescue nursery, you can replace your own sod on a regular basis. So other ideas to reduce maintenance. Um, this is Pepper Pike in uh, Cleveland. Uh, this was a forest. This is now long grasses. Um, the idea of trying not to maintain areas as much as possible. The trick to this, long slide, the trick to this is you need to um, understand where people are not very often and think of this more as an accent. So one of the fascinating things for me is I, I've always looked at one of the reductions is reducing the height of cut of greens. So uh, I went to a presentation and I, for the life of me, I can't remember who it was. And this is something I forgot to look up yesterday. Um, but they did studies where they um, varied the heights of greens over a period of time. And they used a membership survey where all the members at all levels of play were surveyed. And they discovered that the, um, happiest that the um, entire membership was, was actually between nine and a half and 10 and a half. It wasn't 11 or 12. There's no question the elite players are always looking. And funny enough, the 15 handicap is actually really an 18. Uh, they're looking for those high green speeds, but the majority of players actually don't want something that's excessive. And they use this technique to try and um, sort of win the war on, on having excessive green speeds because we all know if we can back off a foot, it, it makes a tremendous uh, amount of difference on um, what we have to spend to keep that condition, but also increases the amount of pin and, and reduces the amount of wear. So that's a huge difference. Tease, so I'm gonna run contrary to the, the 
school of thought that's going on right now. I think we're building too many T's. I think we're, we've lost our minds. So I think we're overthinking this. Uh, I think if we went to more hybrid T's where we had a, a long T, a middle T and a front T and then vary that up to make up for the difference in between those, those T's, we're actually in a much better um, place. I think the amount of uh, intensive maintenance of T's uh, doesn't make up for the reduction, the potential reduction in fairway that sometimes takes place. I think we've got to get back to just a few T's. I think we've lost our minds. And I, by the way, I think um, we also uh, need to just, unless you're uh, an elite club holding elite vents, I think we need to get away from uh, having the excessively uh, long T's because essentially they're turf nurseries and there's no point in having them for the most part. Um, I'm, I'm, I think we got to get back to servicing the majority in most cases, but that that's sort of particularly in public golf more so than private golf. I think that becomes a little more difficult. So raising the height of uh, fairways. One of the fun parts about that is if we all raised our heights of fairway, uh, I know there's some turf reasons for not wanting to do it, but one of the things is because most of the players sweep and don't pinch the ball, 90% of players be far more comfortable. And the interesting thing is it would actually put more pressure on an elite player because now they've got to judge how that ball is going to fly. Uh, I don't think this is an easy one to win. Uh, the other thing is removing the step cut. So um, if we remove the step cut, we remove the need for a mower. We also um, remove about five hours a week on that time to maintain that one area. And the way you remove the step cut is you, if you, think about it, if we can raise our fairways and lower our rough, we don't need that because the transition is not that great. And what we're all fighting with is, is our rough are high, our fairway is so low that the transition is so overwhelming. But if we would actually uh, lower our rough heights, raise our fairway heights, we would actually get away from the step cut. And I, 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 as an architect, I find the step cut to be one of the worst features that have have ever emerged and I actually don't like it architecturally as well. And I spend a lot of time trying to, well, I don't counsel, I push clubs trying to eliminate it. So one of my big things is I wish we could return to seasonality. I'm old enough that I remember playing most of my golf with roughs that went brown and having to accommodate the fact that the ball now didn't stop once it got into the rough and it would roll out into the trees. I work with Quag Field Club in Long Island and they definitely embrace seasonality. Um, this is a green version of that golf course, by the way. Uh, I, I wish we would allow extremes to take place. Um, this is Murray in uh, Scotland. Um, this is what happens once we get to drought. Um, in an ideal world, we would actually embrace this and get back to it. It would save us a lot of money and a lot of effort. And essentially what that comes down to is I, if what I wish we would do is we would stop fertilizing and watering roughs. I always love the Australians who question our sanity by saying they maintain exactly where the player is supposed to be. So they maintain tees, fairways, and greens, and they don't maintain where they shouldn't be. So what they do is they do minimal maintenance beyond. So if they've got rough, they don't water or fertilize it, but what they'll do is they'll, they, they may do a little bit of mowing just to control it, or they may do some control with those areas, but essentially they ignore it. And that's their view that the, the game is supposed to be a lot more sporty than our North American view where you expect a good lie in the rough. Um, in a perfect world, I wish I could sort of encourage that, that um, everything should be more arbitrary once you get outside of the bounds of the fairways. The interesting thing about Quag Field Club is there's no irrigation in the rough. It's actually a central row irrigation system and um, sorry, I'll go back on that. So one of the things that was fascinating about it, I think I actually come to it in two slides from now is uh, we're doing, they're, sorry, they are doing a new irrigation system and the new irrigation system will remain single row with just a little bit more controls around the greens and that's it. So new irrigation systems, one of the biggest problems I've run into with renovations is new irrigation systems are just, they simply start at 2 million or more. I look at all the clubs I work with. I know the financial situation of most of them and they can't, they, they're struggling to deal with the debt that they currently have, whether it's clubhouse related or whether it's renovation related and adding another two and a half million dollars to their 
to their um, borrowing costs is going to be something that they're going to struggle to overcome. Um, as I said, uh, you don't have to be wall-to-wall -wall green and, and Quag's going to continue to embrace that. We had that. It's interesting as an architect being asked to be part of that converse, conversation. And I wish clubs would have that conversation involving us where we can recommend to them that it, it's time to actually allow a little bit more of, of the exterior of the golf holes to just be a little bit more natural, a little, a little more um, uncontrolled. Um, that would be good for the game. So I, I had talked about minimizing maintained area. I do think in a place like Pinehurst, this works really well. I'm not so sure this works in upper New York state where we've got heavier soils. But the idea of just trying to maintain a little bit less and, and figuring that out. Um, I think we have to be very careful with the use of fescues and particularly in heavy soils or um, places where they get reach, uh, get fertility. Uh, I went through this with Pepper Pike. Uh, our goal is to establish what's an accent and every time we get to in play areas we just simply, we may turn those areas into fescue but we, we actively maintain them and cut them and, and we're trying to um, do experiments with uh, adding uh, sand and trying to see if we can get some of those areas thin. But if we can't get them thin, then we just cut them. Uh, just avoid native areas, long grass areas, and play areas. If, if you've got your members are looking at uh, an, an adjacent area like this, then it, it's probably better to just mow these areas a lot more until you can do something that controls it. And put it this way, if you're pulling weeds and spraying in and it's becoming more maintenance than it would as, main, as a rough, mowed rough area, then maybe it's time just to start mowing those areas instead of um, um, trying to maintain a fescue and putting all that intensive work into it. And then I'll throw in the one thing is um, with ticks and everything else, you've just got to be very careful about how far you go with that. So uh, stating the obvious, don't plant trees. Um, the one thing that I've spent a lot of time is explaining the lifetime maintenance obligations of a tree. Uh, I, I didn't think about that till <clears throat> one of the superintendents mentioned that a while ago, and I thought that was a really great observation. If we put a price tag to what a tree is going to cost us over the long run, it's fascinating to think that when a tree goes in, that essentially that tree over its lifetime is going to be a $10,000 commitment. It's mind blowing to think that way. And so trying to get people to be a little bit more careful with their use and species. That's the other thing is understanding certain species are difficult maintenance and other species are, are acceptable maintenance, let's call it. Um, and then the whole aspect of they, they uh, ruin playability, they damage turf and uh, they create horrible growing environments. And frankly, this, is, this to me is uh, the worst example of what golf uh, can devolve to. Um, I'd rather fish than play here. So ideal use of trees. I've always used a slide with committees. Um, that's my view of trees. Uh, I do think they have a place. I do think Parkland, Parkland golf has a place. But I see Parkland golf being fewer trees. And if we could actually start to think like this, we'd have specimen trees. Um, Wingfoot's a great example where they have specimen trees. But essentially, if you get offline, it's really easy to get back and play. My best way to explain it to everybody is if you can't figure out how to get out of a tree line, then there's too many trees. It should be a very easy opportunity to put the ball back in play and return to play. So the other thing is we all know, I'm stating the obvious to all of you, we'd use less water, less fertility, and less applications if we had less trees. And, and the interesting thing is I've always said that to clubs when I'm talking to them. It means more money saved. And my argument has always been that not only is there more money saved, we actually get better playing conditions in the long run. So a quick case study, um, Wheatley Hills uh, in, on Long Island, this is the 13th. This was a renovation that was done in very recent times. I was asked to come in and look at it. This is a Devro Emmett course, and clearly this is not a Devro Emmett um, restoration or renovation. Uh, what happened was they, uh, just this hole alone, they doubled the number of bunkers and they added the high sand faces. Uh, that bunker face on the left is 10 feet deep when you stand in the interior of the bunker and the bunker face itself is more than 45 degrees. And essentially the best way I can describe it is 
it was um, done with a bunker liner and the liner and the sand and everything was literally falling down. Uh, as soon as it got wet, everything fell to the bottom. So this is uh, having an overview. This is what it looked like in plan. The, when you get things back to their simplicity, by the way, back to what was originally there, the three bunkers on the left. And again, remember I was talking about out of position. If you're on the left, you're out of position, you're hitting into the narrow part of the, the green site. The other thing is if you're trying to hit a little flip wedge in, that's uh, you're also 10 feet below the green. So bunkers on the left came out because they originally weren't there. You can see how many trees have also come out around it as well if you have a look. And then getting it back to the original bunkering, which was the fairway bunker was the decision. Interestingly enough, that is very deep and dead. And then uh, the ridge really matters more on the fairway and then back to the original two bunkers. And you can, sorry, you can see the amount of sand is a lot less than uh, the bunkering that's uh, above and the back bunker came out and we increased the uh, green size back to original green. So that's what we took it back to. That's actually the original version of the hole, but you can also start to see the amount of maintenance that was reduced at the same time. And essentially, um, what the superintendent's dealing with is just those banks. And what we've tried to do is get the maintenance down to the things that matter, that sort of um, set that line between success and failure. Um, that's what the steep banks do. And then the rest of it's all maintainable. And that's essentially a case study in how you do it. So funny enough, it's historically accurate, but it's also far more sustainable. So what's holding us back? Um, generally, it's the golfers, and I think that's uh, where architects come in. We have to convince the club through having a, a, a conversation about sustainability that not only involves um, environments, but it involves economics as well. And I do think all of a sudden economic sustainability is going to be a conversation we're going to have. So as I said, I think it's time that architects and architecture takes far more responsibility in what we build and what we leave behind. And I think we uh, have an obligation to make sure that, um, that what we leave for you or what we promote with a, a club has, um, is much more uh, sustainable in the future. And my big argument has always been, if I pair things back to something that works for the club now in harder times, there's nothing to stop you and I and, and the club of adding a few more, adding a, a little bit more detail over time when it's appropriate. And, and that's sort of been my argument. That was my, my argument with Maple Downs. And when things went really well for them, I reached out to them and said, okay, I did say I'd have this conversation. And they came back to me and said, no, we're really happy with the way things work. We like this tight, sustainable model and we're gonna stick with it. So Carl, that's actually my presentation. That's the whole thing. Uh, you know, I found myself uh, nodding my head the whole time. I don't know about you, Frank, but I think uh, I think Ian's a man after every superintendent's heart after, you know, hearing about some of these, uh, you know, aspects, you know, reducing bunkers, uh, you know, drying out the fairways, the seasonality of that, you know, eliminating step cuts, things like that. Um, I have a question for you, Ian, uh, kind of on those topics. Uh, if I'm a superintendent, I'm listening to this and I'm saying, yeah, you know, I, I can really do all of that. Um, but how should I go about talking to my membership or my greens committee? Uh, what's the process they should go through when they see something like this and say, hey, I want to kind of do that? What, what should their, uh, their process be? Rather than just tr trying to sell one of the elements, uh, sell a philosophy first. So promote a philosophy that's... Um, that begins with the idea of that the playing conditions are not going to be reduced, they're going to be different. Um, that the architectural elements may be, um, uh, maybe things are going to be changed a little bit that are going to respect this, but talk about the impact of it so that, um, you know, when I'm selling this, I don't sit there and say, well, the great part is we're going to reduce uh, a golf course by 20 bunkers. I talk about each of the holes strategically and how they're gonna play and, and what impact the changes are going to make to the, the play for players. And so you sell it as, a, as a, a positive, not on what it's going to save for the, the maintenance or for the club, you sell it on uh, an architectural vision or a, a maintenance vision 
on how it's going to be better for them. And then you throw in, by the way, um, this maintenance vision is actually going to save a little bit of money or you never, by the way, you never say it's going to save a little bit of money. You may drop that with a couple of people, but to the membership, when you present as a whole, you say we're going to then be able to work on other details that we think are far more important because you never tell them there's anything. Whenever they ask, I always say, no, we're, we're going to save maintenance in this. We're just going to apply it to other things that you value more. And you have to, you have to phrase your way around things so that they don't ever think anything is coming back. And hopefully for the superintendent, it means they can allocate resources much more appropriately for them. So. Um, Frank, you got any questions? Yeah, Ian, you, you, um, you talked about, well, you know, if you want to have an interesting golf course, you're just going to have to have a couple of tough parts to maintain. Uh, thank you for speaking candidly about that. Um, these things are difficult to maintain. Things like leaky hose and, and how you spray them if, if they need to be sprayed. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, I mean, you know, it seems crazy, but is revetting, have you ever looked at the way to do these faces that, that might make them a little bit better? You mentioned revetting that Gil does it. You know, I, what do you think about trying to make those, what do you do to try to help the superintendent make those areas maybe not as painful to manage? So I better explain the revetting. The revetting is not a, a soil revet that you would think of in the UK, which by the way, those are going away very fast, I've noticed. Mm. Um, the revet is a maximum of five layers, uh, minimum usually about three. And what Gil's doing with that detail is he's creating a, a revetted face that grows in mm. and you allow that grass to actually become established on the face. And so what happens is you get that um, sculpted leading edge, but it's actually, it, it, what happens is everything roots, knits, and you end up with a vertical face that's, that's a maintained edge. It's stable. And it, that's stable. And all he's trying to do is he's just trying to create that. As you saw in the one picture of St. George's, we did it with topsoil filled burlap bags. Mm. And so that's a rich organic soil. Part of the reason is, um, one of the issues at St. George's is it's actually a really light sandy loam. Mm. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to get an area that retains more moisture than anywhere else at the leading edge, mm. because um, any experiment that was done, that detail was actually established in 2000 when we did the first restoration. Anything that we tried before that with trying to use the native soils, it dried out and it broke down too easily. Mm. And what we found was while we'd lose a few bunker edges that way, they actually held up pretty good. So we, when we went to do it again with the Billy Bunker, because Ian wanted Billy Bunker because of the the washout problem that he had. And he's got um, sand faces that are 10 feet high, but it's got historical importance. So, and it's got a club that's wealthy enough to actually take care of that. So that's why we did that detail is um, we needed more organic at that edge rather than doing, we did actually talk about the revets. Um, but um, we struggled with the fact that the faces were so steep, the revetting actually created a really complicated detail as we were experimenting. If you can imagine, we had some pretty high priced talent working with shovels for a day. We we're trying to figure out um, a way of doing it. We tried five or six different ways. And we came back to the, the topsoil filled bags. By the way, that burlap uh, rots in about uh, 20, 25 days. So what about the Billy Bunker? You mentioned it, Ian. Um, I, you know, I like how you talk about the, the lifetime maintenance obligations, the lifetime costs, how long these things, uh, you know, will require, uh, will live. Uh, have you seen enough about Billy Bunker use or that, at least that sort of, uh, you know, permeable concrete in a pervious surface? Uh, do you see that as a, as a long-term solution if you're going to invest in it? So, yes. Um, uh, so far with, uh, I, I had some questions on how it would hold up over the winter and because we have, particularly out west, we have some really harsh winters. But there are some examples in the Midwest and the US that um, have a number of 
tough winters behind them. We just don't, to be honest, we don't know over 20 years whether that's going to make a difference, whether it's going to hold up, but so far it seems to. Um, so that's always been my question mark, whereas the clay, I always know, um, I deal with really extreme freeze thaw in Quebec. That's why we use clay. Um, because of that, I know it works. I know pretty much every liner doesn't over time. Um, so I'm not very fond of the cloth or any material liners. Uh, bentonite seems to work better than anything else. That's actually a clay liner for ponds. Um, but part of it, because it relies on its own weight, and the thing is you can seal it with, um, with a torch. You can actually melt it together as a sheet. Yeah. Yeah. It's like putting down a blanket and you don't need the staples. But I find anything that needs anything to pin it into place has become a problem. My problem is uh, there's no perfect solution. Um, uh, I would say Billy is the best one I've seen. My pro I, by the way, and I will speak, there are other solutions. I just have not worked with them. So just so everybody knows, uh, I, would, I would ask your peers. Um, my problem with Billy Bunker is the enormous expense that goes with it and the permanence. So here's my viewpoint from an architect's point of view that will be funny. I don't believe I can get it right the first time. Even when I'm doing a restoration, I'm going to make mistakes. One of the joys of going back to do St. George's was I did the work in 2000. I got to actually fix my mistakes. I apologize, this is gonna bing for a while. It's our, um, well, we have a grandfather clock. Um, so the, I got to fix my mistakes, but I made mistakes. But if you do Billy Bunker now to fix a mistake or say, Say my work is god awful and you need another architect to fix the fact I was a horrible architect. It's actually a lot to pull the whole thing apart. And that's one of my things uh, that I struggle with. I, I think Billy Bunker has its place when you're when when permanence is really permanence, where say say you were the National Golf Links and, and it's historically accurate and you want it to be that way for another hundred years. I, I think yes, definitely, because it'll last forever. But um, I struggle with the idea of uh, if I do a renovation like to Laval, I'm sure when I'm long gone or they're tired of that, somebody else is going to do work. If I've done Billy Bunker, it's actually a heck of a lot to deal with it. And then there's a whole question of um, because of our laws, is there, um, can we dispose of it? So, I mean, I, I hate yeah, to- Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think about it this way. The, the, it's a big upfront expense. It seems to be working in many places and it better buy you a lot of years of not having to do it again. And any, whatever that iteration is, whether you got to do it because, you know, somebody said, I didn't like it this way, I wanted another way, or you got to do it because it failed. However, um, you know, it better get me enough years that it, that it makes it worth that investment. And a lot of that is, as I've seen it, is touted as reducing the sort of regular maintenance throughout. But yep. I very much appreciate as we wrap up past the witching hour, Carl, Ian, that you were basically saying, do you really need these things? And it was very telling that you took the 18th at Beth Page, because I know Carl himself has geeked himself out on the uh, 18th and some of the changes that they made that resulted in a different golf hole. Uh, but uh, having pumped those bunkers out myself during the 2009 U.S. Open, I, I could agree with you on their uh, value as an amenity, uh, not necessarily a necessity. So thank you very much, Ian. A joy to have you. Carl, I'll pass it back to you. Yeah, so um, again, Ian, really, uh, really enjoyed that. I was, I was nodding my head the whole time. Um, we, we don't have any questions, so uh, I guess what I'll do is I'll just wrap up real quick. Uh, I do want to recognize our sponsors again um, for all their uh, support pulling this off. So um, once again, uh, GCSA NY, um, big ups to Suzanne Miss who, who helped put us, uh, uh, get this organized. Um, <clears throat> Platinum sponsors, again, Andre and Son, First Tour for Ornamental, uh, Grassland, Harrells, uh, Finch Turf, BASF, Pump Irrigation Technologies, and MTE are our gold sponsors, uh, and our silver sponsors, Syngenta, Ewing, Turf and Soil Diagnostics, Nutrient Solution, Weaver Golf Turf Solutions, and DryJet. Uh, and with that, um, Frank, unless you have any last words, I uh, just want to say thanks to, to Ian again. Uh, thanks to all our guests. I don't know if Doug sold that from last week or is on as well but um you know this is really fun to put on and, and i think and hope uh, it was pretty educational for everybody thanks very much ian thanks to the gcsamy everybody be safe
Thank you, everybody, and I appreciate uh, appreciate the opportunity. Yep. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.